I fear not the dark itself, but what may lurk within it. Welcome to Lurk, bringing you creepy, strange, and bone-chilling stories with your host, Jamie Jackson. Hey, Lurkers, welcome to this week's episode. We have a missing 411 case to cover this week, but first I wanted to give you a little rundown about the Virginia Bigfoot convention that I attended this weekend. So I went to the ECBRO Bigfoot convention in Staunton, Virginia. Um, I went, my mom joined me, and uh, Liz from So Sci-Fi and Beyond also rode down with me. And we were about 30 minutes from the hotel when my van broke down. So we got a tow truck. We crammed into the tow truck cab, the three of us with the tow truck driver. Um, There's a photo that I may or may not share on social media, depending on how flattering or unflattering it is, because I didn't really look at it too close. We get to a mechanic that is basically in the middle of nowhere. They cannot fix the problem. It is a transmission problem. Transmission fluid all over the bottom of the van, which I suspected based on what had happened when it was dying on Interstate 81. So then we have to get a ride to the hotel and we end up with a fake Uber because they they didn't actually work for Uber, but they gave rides to people. And after quoting us one price, they decided that when they got there to pick us up, it was going to be a higher price. We had no choice but to pay it. And on the way to the hotel, Liz was screenshotting our location on Google Maps every five minutes and sending it to her boyfriend in the event that he might have to come find our bodies. Obviously, Liz watches way too much true crime. But honestly, the three of us actually all were thinking of different scenarios and mapping out a plan based on those scenarios and how we were going to handle it. We get to the hotel without any incident, a lot less money than what we started out with, and uh, we enjoyed the hotel bar. And then we were in the lobby that evening because we had to wait for my husband and stepson to show up at the hotel with a new vehicle for us. Thanks, Dad, for the use of your truck. And they were also bringing the van on a a vehicle dolly to the hotel so we could unload all of Liz's crap out of the van into the truck. Literally, it was Liz's stuff. I I literally had two bins. She claimed she had three. It was like three bins, five tackle boxes, four tables, and a partridge in a pear tree. Anyway, we're in the lobby waiting for them to show up, and we meet uh, this great couple. We chatted for a while with them about Bigfoot, Mothman, ghosts, I mean, pretty much just about anything paranormal we kind of touched upon in this conversation. Without a doubt, they were the biggest highlight of the entire weekend. So I want to give a shout out to Mondo and Jana for coming over to talk to us and for being really awesome people. And we, we had interactions with them that night and then several times the next day before they ended up heading out for the day. Um, as for myself, my mom and Liz, we made it back home without incident in my dad's truck. On a weird note, our mechanic cannot find where the trans- transmission fluid was actually leaking from. So he put more fluid in, he's driven it around, he can't find a leak, so we're taking it back home, using it to see what happens. I will not drive the van. Uh, I'm done with the van, not driving it, not interested in riding in it as a passenger. I know the planets are aligned this month, I'm guessing that's making things more wonky than they already are, I don't know. It was just crazy, just by luck. Anyway. Let's get to this week's episode. We're going to be covering the disappearance of 14-year-old Stacy Aris, who went missing in Yosemite National Park. 
Yosemite is located in California in the Sierra Nevada mountains. It was first protected by President Abraham Lincoln when he signed the Yosemite Grant of 1864, which declared the area a federally preserved land. In 1890, John Muir led a movement that had Congress establish it as a national park, and that helped start the national park system. Yosemite is 759,620 acres, or roughly the size of the state of Rhode Island. There are an estimated 4 million visitors, mostly during the peak months of June, July, and August, and they typically stay within a 7 square mile area of the most popular locations. 95% of the park is designated wilderness. The definition of a designated wilderness is um, an intact or undisturbed natural environment. It's a wild natural area that has not been significantly modified by any human activity, such as laying of pipelines, construction of roads, or any other industrial infrastructure. Yosemite Falls within the park is the highest waterfall in North America at 2,425 feet. As far as large animals, it is host to black bears, mountain lions, and bighorn sheep. There are very few animal attacks reported within the park. Also, if you're a fan of Ansel Adams' photos, many of them were taken in Yosemite. During July 1981, 14-year-old blonde hair, blue-eyed Stacy Aris, her father George, and several others were on a horseback trip through Yosemite. I'm not sure on the exact number of people in their group. I've seen numbers from around 6 all the way up to 10. So somewhere between 6 and 10 other people in the group and then Stacy and her father. On July 17, 1981, the group stopped for lunch at Upper Cathedral Lake and then continued on towards Sunrise High Sierra Camp which was their destination for the night. After a couple of hours, they reached camp. The Upper Cathedral Lake is about three and a half miles north of the camp along the John Muir Trail. If you're hiking, it's about an hour and a half. Sunrise High Sierra Camp is the last camp on a 50 mile High Sierra Camp Loop. It has nine cabins and beds for 34 people, located in an alpine meadow with views of Mount Florence and Mount Clark. It was built in 1961 to make backcountry an alluring destination for tourists, offering stunning wilderness vistas, but also creature comforts like showers and reasonably comfortable beds. When the group got to camp, everyone went to freshen up and settle in after their day on horseback. At the camp, Stacy complained of some aches and pains from riding all day and went to her cabin to clean up and change her clothes. I can say from experience that most likely her aches and pains included her thighs, her calves, probably her butt from sitting in the saddle. Typical aches and pains. I don't think it was anything that was out of the ordinary. After changing, she told her dad that she was going to hike to the ridge to take some photos. She asked him to go with her, but he declined. And that's something he probably regretted for the rest of his life. As a parent, when something happens to your children, you constantly look back and beat yourself up about what you could have done differently in these situations. Before she left, Stacy's dad noticed she had sandals on, and he told her to go change into her hiking boots. The conversation about her boots was the very last one her dad George had with her. Now this part might get a little confusing because there are a couple of versions of what happened in the newspaper articles. One version says that 71 year old or 77 year old, there's several different ages for him. He's in his, he's somewhere between 70 and 77. Uh, Gerald Stewart, who was one of the members of the horseback riding group was sitting on a large boulder on the trail. And Stacy had told her dad that she was going over to where Gerald was sitting 
to take the photos. The other version says that Gerald opted to hike with Stacy from camp to the ridge. Now, most of the accounts say he was sitting on the boulder. She told her dad she was hiking to where Gerald was sitting on the boulder. And then he joins her. So, along the way, Gerald becomes winded. The elevation there is about 9,200 feet. And he was older and probably feeling the effects from the altitude. So he sat on a boulder to catch his breath while Stacy went on ahead. Stacy mentioned going to take photos of the lake. There were two lakes in the area, from what I understand. Long Meadow Lake, which I couldn't really find on a map, but is supposed, supposedly not very far from camp. And Sunrise Lake, which is about a one-mile hike from camp, which is about a 30-minute time frame. The trail to Sunrise Lake is low level and considered a relatively easy trail. My guess is this is the lake she was headed to based on the fact that there was a marked trail to it from camp. There was mention in some of the reports that the lake she was hiking to was in sight of the camp, but according to one local, the area where she went missing had no lake within sight. I chalk this up to some missing translation of information within the media. Which, I mean, come on. It's not surprising the media would not be 100% accurate in sharing the information they're getting. Plus, they're getting it from a lot of different sources. So Gerald, the 70-something member of the group, grew tired and sat down on a boulder to rest and wait for Stacy to go to the lake, take her photos, and come back. Members of the group could see Gerald sitting on the boulder, waiting. Chris Grimes, the trail guide, was in the corral and glanced up the hill and saw Stacy standing on a large boulder about 50 yards south of the trail, looking off into the sunset before heading down the hill out of sight. This was the last known time anyone saw Stacy. Gerald started to grow concerned when Stacy didn't return, and he started looking for her. One newspaper article read, She was last seen by a 77-year-old man who said he met her on a trail and accompanied her for 20 to 30 minutes before turning back towards camp. The man, who was traveling with the Packers, told park officials he talked with a group of people coming from the direction in which the girl had hiked, but they hadn't seen her. As the article says, Gerald spoke to three hikers coming from the direction Stacy had gone. The three hikers said they hadn't even seen her. Gerald alerted the others in the group, and they all began searching more extensively. By the morning of July 18th, the real search began. There were 150 people searching for Stacy. That included 67 mountain rescue volunteers. Eight K-9 teams worked over 10 days, covering three to five square miles around Sunrise Lakes. The dogs never picked up a scent. An article in 1981 Fresno Bee said the dog handlers stated the dogs were unable to pick up any scent because of the dry and dusty conditions. Three helicopters were involved in the search, including the park's own chopper that was in the air for about 57 hours. The man hours for the search totaled 8,004. Skin divers searched the lakes. Mountain climbers searched cliffs and crevices. The only thing that was ever found of Stacy was the lens cap off of her camera, just inside the tree line where she was last seen. It isn't really unusual to lose a lens cap off a camera. There's a reason why I bought the lens cap keeper for mine. Lens caps just fall off. It's not hard. So it's not like... It came off in any kind of struggle or anything. It probably just, she either didn't snap it in place, it fell off, it got bumped, whatever. It's very, it's not really significant. When she went missing, Stacy was 5 feet 5 inches tall and weighed 120 pounds. She was wearing an off-white pullover windbreaker with a horizontal zipper front pocket that was at about the breast line and a hood that hangs down the back or tucks inside. She also wore an all-white jersey blouse with a quarter-inch white lace around the square neckline 
that was tight fitting. Shorts with vertical half inch maroon and white stripes with intermittent sky blue pinstripes and an approximate half inch slit on the sides. No pockets, pull on type shorts, no belt or buttons, and gray hiking boots size eight and a half or nine. She also had a gold double wraparound ankle bracelet. She was carrying her small Olympus camera with an embroidered neck strap that was multicolored, but primarily black. She might have also had gum and cigarettes, and she had upper and lower retainers on her teeth. This is the most specific description of a missing person I've ever actually read. Um, I'm guessing it's most likely because there were so many photos taken during the trip that they they had a photo of her the day that she went missing. There are many theories about what could have happened to Stacy Aris. There was some talk about the fact that Stacy was experiencing some family and school trouble, and specifically that she missed her boyfriend. Some people think that she chose this opportunity to run away. But National Park spokeswoman Linda Abbott countered that Stacy was not planning to go on a long walk because she was originally heading out in her flip-flops before being told to change into hiking boots. If she was choosing to run away, it was incredibly poor planning on her part. I'm not saying 14-year-old girls are known for their logic and reasoning, though. Just that if you're going to run away from a camp in the middle of the mountains... You probably would think to put your hiking boots on on your own without being told. And you probably would take some type of day pack with you with some kind of provision. I can't imagine that even just being a 14 year old girl, you wouldn't think of that if that was your goal to run away. Most people believe that she went off the trail during her hike and got lost and fell off a cliff or into a crevice but there were searchers working the grid method during the search and the areas were marked off and thoroughly searched and nothing was found. Animal attack has been ruled out. No one in Yosemite has been attacked by any of the black bears that are in residence there. And honestly, black bears are shy and prefer to be left alone for the most part. Also, there was no sign of any struggle found or any sign of any attack. So during an animal attack, you're going to probably see um, an area on the ground where there's a struggle. You're probably going to see clothing. Animals typically don't carry off things like cameras, so the camera probably would have been found. And there most likely would have been some type of blood evidence. Foul play was never ruled out as a cause for her disappearance. Gerald, who you would think is the most likely person to have done something, he actually was always in the view of members of the group, and he was not a suspect. Plus, he was older, and he obviously was having trouble with the altitude. Something that's interesting is that the Park Service has refused to release the case file, even with a Freedom of Information Act request. David Politis, author of the Missing 411 books, requested the files, along with others, including the parents of Stacey Harris, and they were all denied. The following is David Politis' account of a conversation he had with Park employee regarding the files. So there was essentially nothing about that case for 25, 30 years. I made a request on it through Yosemite for the Freedom of Information Act, to get a copy of the report. A special agent for the Park Service named Yu called me and asked me why I wanted the report. And I explained that we were doing some research on search and rescue, and we were specifically looking into people who disappeared at Yosemite. And we wanted to see what in the report that was there. And he said there was nothing there. And I said, well, are there any suspects? Is it a criminal case? He said, nope. It's a missing persons case. I said, has anybody looked at it in the past 10 or 20 years? He says, not that I can think of. And I said, so there's no suspects. There's no work done on the case. She hasn't been found. Correct. And I said, 
okay, well, could you send me a copy of the case? And he says, nope. I said, why not? He says, because it's an open case and you'll never see it. And I said, but we've gotten dozens and dozens of missing persons cases from the park service. Why not this case? He goes, you'll never see it. And I said, what do you mean I'm not going to get it? It's an open missing persons case. Any criminal elements? Nope. I said, are there any suspects? Nope. Well, why won't you give it to me then? And he says, well, we never give away these cases. I said, wait a minute. I have dozens and dozens of these cases from your agency all over the U.S. He said, no, you don't. I said, yes, I do. And we get into this talk. He challenges me. He's rude. He says, right from the get-go, I'm never going to get this. And so far, he's right. And we got off the phone. I went to my local congressman, Ian Campbell. I appealed through him, his representative in Washington, D.C., and met with the representative from the Department of the Interior, and I got an answer back saying they won't release the case. The family of Stacy got a hold of me. They publicly asked for the case. It was denied. They made an appeal through the Park Service so the family could read the case, and this has dragged on, I think, for two or three years. And they still haven't seen the case. So what happened to Stacy? Don't really know. But according to the Freedom of Information Act and what the law is intended to do is give us access to information that our government has. This isn't a criminal case. There are no suspects. There's no crime that is thought to have been to have occurred. Nobody can explain to me or that family why we can't see that case. The National Park System apparently claims that they don't want to release the files in the case. The National Park Service claims that they don't want to release the files in case they want to switch it from missing to a criminal case. Other cases that are still open and unsolved cases from the same date have been released. Why not these? It really doesn't help the Park Service to not release these. There really doesn't seem to be a good enough reason not to. They've said there's no suspects. It's not considered a criminal case. It's an open missing person case. Wouldn't releasing the files possibly help in coming up with a clue or an idea of what might have happened to her? Why won't you let the family of the girl who's missing see the case files? It's been 40 years. 41 years, 41 years just about since she went missing and they won't let the family see the case files. That's an asinine. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And it really begs the question, what are they hiding? So typically this is where I would end the episode, but I'm not done with strange missing cases in the same area where Stacy disappeared. In 1968, an unidentified male's body was found in a crevasse one mile north of Sunrise Lake in Ten Tenaya Peak. It's a remote area. So how did he get there? Why wasn't he reported missing? He has never been identified to this day. How did they find him if they didn't know how to look? They just happened to look down in a crack in a rock and there was a body? I mean, I guess, honestly, that's what happened. There's basically no information to be found regarding this unidentified body. So I'm not able to find a whole lot to give you to shed any more light on what happened. But that is the first obviously missing person because nobody knows who he is. So he's got to be missing. That's the first one in 1968. On May 24, 1976, Jeff Estes was about one and a half miles away from Sunrise Lake and Tenaya Peak when he disappeared. Estes had planned an overnight solo hike. He was hiking to May Lake to spend the night, then hiking back in the morning along the Snow Creek Trail. Jeff was dropped off at May Lake Road and Tioga Road. 
The trail he was following was well marked and well traveled and follows a small creek most of the way. So the idea that he could become lost seems like an unlikely one. Jeff was 25 when he went missing. He was five foot 10 inches tall, weighed 165 pounds, had brown hair and green eyes and a mustache. He has never been found. None of his gear has ever been found either. There was no trace of him at all. And remember, he's backpacking, he's planning on camping. So he has a backpack, he has um, at least a change of clothes, probably a sleeping bag, a tent, food of some sort, possibly a small cook stove. Most likely, if he's somebody who's, he seems like somebody who is familiar with hiking and backpacking. So I'm going to go on the assumption that he has navigational aids like a compass, map, flashlight. There's a million little things that you take in your pack. It's only an overnight, so probably not too heavy of a pack, but a tent can be pretty heavy. So maybe 20 pounds in his pack and none of it is found. Not one piece of his gear has ever been found. Then in 1981, that's when Stacy Aris goes missing. So, so far we have 1968 with the unidentified male, 1976 with Jeff Estes, and 1981 with Stacy Aris. Then, July 5th, 1988, Timothy Barnes disappears. Timothy was in an area to the left of Tanaya Lake near Highway 120, east of Tioga Road. Around 9 a.m., he planned to hike Polydome Lakes, which was three miles from the Tanaya Lake. He was hiking on Murphy Creek Trail that starts at the Tanaya Lake and is a half mile to Polydome. He had hiking and camping gear with him. None of his gear was ever found. Neither was he. He was eventually declared legally dead in 1990. So in one small area, we have three people missing and one unidentified body of someone no one reported missing, essentially. Possibly. They could be reported missing and it just hasn't clicked. He could have been from out of state, hiking, vacationing there, and nobody's made the connection that of identification. I also did a little bit of checking out of things because I was curious, based on the mentions of some of the hikers being dropped off, just how far was it to a road from Sunrise Lake where Stacy Aris was supposedly hiking to. From Sunrise Lake to Tioga Road, it's only 4.3 miles, or about an hour and 45 minutes to about a two-hour hike. It is not out of the realm of possibility that Stacy could have been forced to hike to the road and driven out of the area. It's a pretty believable scenario. I was a little shocked when I actually pulled up the map, and I will be including a link to the map of the area in the show notes, which are found in the description of the episode, so that you can see it yourself. I kind of was shocked that there was actually a road that close. And then I think that road actually hooks up with Highway 120. So there are ways in and out of there that don't require you to be on horseback or hiking. 4.3 miles is not a, really that big of a deal. I have hiked five miles, well, <laughs> back before I gained weight, I hiked five miles with little to no effort. Basically, we're probably never going to know what happened to Stacy Harris or the other two missing men, and the John Doe may never actually be identified. Before we end the episode, I want to stress that if you happen to be out hiking and you end up lost, you need to remember the acronym STOP. So I'm going to get a little bit, um, scout leader here on you. Some people I know who listen, hike, or enjoy the outdoors, have kids who enjoy the outdoors. So I want to stress this because I think it's important, especially when we've been talking about a lot of missing 411 cases. 
So let's try to prevent any lurkers from actually becoming a missing 411 case, shall we? So remember the word stop. S stands for stop and stay where you are. People who get lost tend to continue to wander and this makes it much harder to be found. If you aren't sure where you are, stop and stay put. It makes it easier for search and rescue to find where you are. T stands for think. Consider what resources you have should the situation extend into the overnight. Develop confidence by considering your situation and being prepared. O stands for observe. Check out your surroundings. Do you see trail markers? Do you hear other hikers nearby? Is there a shelter that you can use if you're stuck there overnight? P stands for plan. Determine what you can do to conserve energy and be as comfortable as possible. Don't panic. Rely on your knowledge and observations. Build a fire. So that's going to do it for this episode. Remember, you can find Lurk wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts or at lurkpodcast.com. Tell your friends. And if you have a minute, consider giving us a five-star review. You can also find our social media links on the website. And as always, we have merch at lurkpodcastmerch.com. And until next time, keep lurking.